Welcome to a special edition of Truth and Truthiness. We're terribly pleased and honored to have Professor Rolf Hoffman, Nobel Laureate in Chemistry, with us today to discuss his research in chemistry. It's a pleasure to have you. I'm glad to be here, Ken. It's really nice. It's really nice. Yeah. You want to move on to your research and your science, which yes. as we know is high pressure yes. chemistry. Yeah. And um, let's move on to that. That's one that in recent times has been under behavior of matter under high pressure. Right. Uh, and when I say high pressure, I don't mean uh, that in a in a tire of 36 pounds no, no. per square inch. I mean about a million times a that. A million atmospheres. Well, um, Professor Hoffman's uh, research into high pressure chemistry, as he just mentioned, is not what you'd think. Uh, it is not, you know, putting stuff in a pot and turning up the steam. He's talking about huge amounts of pressure that are normally not seen here on Earth. And so some of the principles around uh, that govern how matter behaves under high pressure are no different uh, from those that govern our behavior under high pressure. I could tell you a little bit about that. Oh, is that, that right? Yeah. I mean, for instance, uh, if you were to go and what's going to happen to to atoms and molecules when you squeeze them uh, to pressures, to high pressures? Mm -hmm. uh, well, they're going to get closer together. It's the they are. They are. sardines in the can principle. Right, but Professor Hoffman, where do, where do we see this kind of pressure? I mean, is it actually something that's in this building, in this beautiful Duffield Hall? Actually, is it in the center of the Earth? Is it in outer space? I mean, the kind of pressures you're talking about, you know, where yes. are they actually physically present? So, they are present in ways we don't see, oh, really? but of which there is evidence, I'll tell you about, uh, in the interior of planets. Interior and, planets, like the interior of Earth. Uh, yes. The center of the Earth. The center of the Earth is a pressure of about three and a half million atmospheres. Is it's right? impossible to believe almost. It comes from gravity. We, we, we haven't sent anything down to the center of the Earth. We haven't journeyed to the center uh, of the Earth. <laughs> that's, that's been reserved for science fiction. It's a frontier where we haven't dared to journey. We haven't even penetrated through the mantle. We've tried to drill right. through it. But first you encounter a lot of molten stuff. Um, and then eventually it turns into a solid. At the very interior of the Earth, there's probably a solid core of iron metal, very much compressed. Very under pressure. Yeah. At that pressure of three and a half million atmospheres, a cube of iron is going to shrink by a factor of five. Is that I mean, right? imagine Superman. That's what you need, taking mm -hmm. this cube of iron and compressing it by so that the volume goes down by a so factor. So we go of from what we see in the gases in the Earth, the molecules spread apart, right. to solids, to matters, to these really compressed matters. Yes. Now, there's the one piece of thing that we see that we usually don't think about that is evidence of uh, pressure having been effective are diamonds. Diamonds. So, uh, as people uh, may or may not know, uh, the carbon exists in several forms. It exists as coal, which is impure, mm -hmm. but the pure part of the coal is pure carbon is graphite mm -hmm. and we see that in a pencil lead mm -hmm. where it's mixed with a little bit of clay right. uh, but that's graphite. Graphite is actually more stable than diamond, another form of carbon. It's more stable than diamond. Diamond's yeah. hard. Isn't it the I hardest know. thing we know? It is hard but it <laughs> but over a billion years is diamonds right? are going to turn into coal. And graphite, and, right. and graphite graph turned to graphite. Now, uh, the, uh, there's something interesting which I want to get at. If you had an election tomorrow mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. about what is more stable, graphite, mm -hmm. black, slippery graphite, mm -hmm. or beautiful, expensive, clear, white diamond. I'm for diamonds. You're not the only one, <laughs> but I tell you, black is beautiful. And uh, actually, diamonds are less stable.
description stuff. I mean, if we want to get realistic about having a thousand atmospheres, or is this a million atmospheres? How many atmospheres are we talking about? You actually, a uh, million atmospheres. All right. uh, just near here in Bard Hall, there yep. is an apparatus that can generate a million atmospheres. Is that atmospheres. right? Well, what is that like? What is that? It looks like a big box. Yeah? And in it are, is uh, a lot of uh, things being uh, screwed together. Mechanical and pressure. Mechanical pressure and also hydrostatic pressure that mm -hmm. is through a fluid. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, mechanical pressure and the ultimate adjustment may be, in fact, just turning a screw. Is that right? And in, at the center of it, in a little cell between two diamonds, which are oh, the so hardest they have thing now. The diamonds, though, are We're not. We're going to put a picture of this yeah. up for our audience. You so. have two diamonds, and they're <laughs> squeezed together, and around the, the two diamonds are coming together, the flat uh, surfaces of the diamonds mm -hmm. are compressing something. Around it is a donut-shaped uh, gasket, as it's mm -hmm. called, mm -hmm. something that gives a little bit, and the diamonds are squeezed together. In there, you get millions of atmospheres. Is that right? You're actually squeezing the diamonds? Squeezing the diamonds. Right here in Bartlett. Yeah. All right. But I didn't finish the story of where the okay. diamonds come from. Where do the diamonds come from? The diamonds come from holes in the earth, of course. Holes? Uh, they're called kimberlite pipes. Is that they're right? Big, they're big pipes where, and w those pipes, they're in a kind of sand, mm -hmm. compressed, in them are lying little diamonds. They have been pressed through the mantle from the interior well, from the of the interior of the earth. Come up from the high because pressure under pressure, graphite, which is the most stable, I keep insisting that okay. nice black graphite is more stable, <laughs> even though it's cheaper yeah, yeah. than diamonds by a lot. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, it's if you want to turn it into diamonds, you have to apply a lot of pressure. Well, that's what you have in the interior of the earth. So in the interior of the earth. Coal has turned into diamond. And then it comes up. And comes up through And it, it wasn't it true that actually one of the first uses of high pressure chemistry was to make diamonds? To make synthetic diamonds. Yeah. But who knows? Mm, the people who did that at General Electric, not too far from us in Schenectady, mm -hmm. you know, they only make industrial diamonds. Yeah. Uh, I wonder, I wonder if there isn't a t an agreement, tacit or paying, between General Electric and De Beers Mines, <laughs> or... Don't uh, make your diamonds too big. Don't make your diamonds too walls. big. The economy of Russia and South Africa yeah. depends on diamonds being expensive. Right. Well, we're saying science and the real world has these and things. And if any of my friends invents a new way of making diamond, hey, this is a model. Is that a diamond? That's a model of how the carbon atoms are arranged in diamond. Yeah. Got to show this to your audience. You, could you zoom that in, somebody? Uh, fantastic. That's now, uh, don't worry. The balls uh, are not orange. They're not. The ball. This is a model. Mm -hmm. Nor do, nor are they painted with a C for carbon on them. Mm -hmm. That's just a symbol. But they're arranged in space like this. A beautiful, very stable array with each atom bonded to four others rigidly, it doesn't give right. diamonds very hard. Right. Uh, that's what diamond looks so like. So can we press that together, though? I mean, is that as compressed as it gets, or what happens it's when It's about as compressed. Even this gives a little bit. So is that right? just about at the pressures yeah. in the interior of the earth, the it goes keeps the same structure. Mm -hmm. But as you compress it, these, these uh, distances between the carbon right? atoms get shorter by about 10 percent in the center only. of the Earth. But what are some of the extreme things, extreme landscapes that happen at high pressure that we may not think of, you know, that well, the, God does? The first thing that happens is uh, gases become liquids and liquids become solids. Uh, most people know about liquefying gas, even right. natural gas. Liquefied natural takes gas. takes very little pressure to liquefy natural gas. Mm -hmm. And that's how it's shipped by pipelines yep. as a liquid. Yep. And that's how it's stored in yep. tanks. And then it's converted into a gas on the site. So, and then if you compress a little more, you get solid. Everyone knows one... Solid gas. Yeah, everyone knows one solid gas. That's dry ice. Dry ice, right. right, right. Uh, that's mm -hmm. CO2. Mm -hmm. Not very healthy. I wouldn't breathe in dry ice. Right, right. Uh, but when you liquefy it and compress it, uh, when you then compress it further, it turns into a solid. Is that right? So that's a, a, 
So things become solid. Then if you press them a little bit more, they get closer together, the atoms in matter, and they become metals. And they get so close Metal. together that the electrons, which are usually connected to one atom, mm -hmm. become, uh, they, they, they sort of don't know where they should be going. Is that so right? they start associating themselves with other atoms and they lie around. The picture I like to give of, of sort of what happens in general when you compress something is that you get closer together. You just get closer. So the picture I have is, uh, and everyone knows this, everyone's gone in the New York subway. Uh, you know, you go in a subway car and the first thing that operates is not physics but uh, but sort of human nature, you sit as far apart from strangers unless you're in love with somebody and you sit right next yeah, to them. But but usually you out. sort of distribute yourself far apart. Then you come in more people and let's say it's New York subway where you're sitting in a long bench and you're going to have two nearest neighbors. Two nearest, the people when there aren't too many you. people, people are going to avoid standing. Right, right. Now, you come at rush hour, you may want to have two Tax. neighbors. Oh. No chance in the world you're going to have two neighbors. Six, right. or if you're small, you're going to have more people pressing on you. So you get more neighbors, more yeah. crystalline neighbors. Well, what is the hierarchy response is the pressure in crystal? What happens first, what happens second? If I press well, this thing together? Well, the first thing that happens is, even before you get more near neighbors, yeah. the first thing is you, you squeeze out sort of empty space. That's what's happening, except it's not empty. There are small forces. So you've squeezed out the empty space, except it's not quite empty between atoms and molecules. There are mm -hmm. weak forces. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. You, you come closer together. Then you get more near neighbors. After that, the electrons become detached from you. That doesn't happen in subway cars, fortunately. Right. Pressure well, is not big enough. I heard this next second response, increasing coordination. Increasing coordination. What is that? Increasing coordination. That means get more neighbors. Oh, that means get more neighbors. That's what you've already told me. That. So you've got, you're in the subway, and now instead of having your, your nearest two neighbors, you've got six neighbors. You've got six neighbors. That's coordination, all right? Yeah. Now, <laughs> you can get more neighbors um, if you're not in a, a human being in a subway car, but if you're an orange, yeah. at Wegmans, yeah. in a stack of oranges. I'm going to ask you a question. How many neighbors does an orange have in a stack of oranges? Well, I know that the most you can do if you put them all together is 74%, but I don't know the number of neighbors. It depends oh, on the size of the orange. Oh, this was done by people thousands of years ago. Okay, First of all, right. supposing you're in a plane. Huh? Supposing you're in a plane, uh, meaning that you, you don't stack in three dimensions, just in a... What about six? Six. You got there it. We got six. top, bottom, left, right, whatever. Right. You got East, six. west. Six are out. Okay, that's what you get for human beings in a subway car okay. because human beings don't climb on top of each other, right? Normally. Normally not. Yeah. But in a subway car, I mean in a stack at Wegmans, oranges, oranges are on top of each other. Oranges are on top and they're below. So around one orange, how many, oh, I gave it away by pointing it. Uh, how many oranges can you get around a... Um, uh, when you stack, when you put one into, a, there are oranges, there's a little hollow, yeah, yeah. orange sits on top. Yeah. How many oranges can you put around that one? Turns out, turns out you can put three around one that's underneath. Is that on right? On top and three on bottom, so the total is 12. Yeah, but I want to squish the oranges. I don't want to screw around with oranges. I want to really press matter a thousand atmospheres. How do uh, I do that, though? I mean, I really, you know, the oranges, uh, are, yeah. they're, they're so squashed by now. We're so best oranges. That's it. You got it. <laughs> You said it, oranges are squashed. Okay. Yeah. So what happens is the, the oranges, when they're piled up with 12 nearest neighbors yep. around each other. Oh, 12 now. Tw one orange has 12 around. Okay. There's still empty space, little nooks and, little crannies, nooks? Nooks and crannies of empty those. space. You've got to squash some more. The, the oranges have got no choice but to get closer together. Mm -hmm. They're going to... You just you said it. They're gonna be squashed up. So that what they do is they squeeze into the nooks and crannies, mm -hmm. and they fill all of space mm -hmm. with the debris of oranges. The juice, Orange horrible <laughs> exactly. oh, juice being squeezed together. Well, well we got a little video.
If you take a plastic and you introduce a ceramic or an inorganic to make a composite out of it, you can make it to be stiffer, but at the same time you make it to be easier to break. You make it more brittle, as we say. In nanocomposites, you can actually have both. Well, the applications can be really uh, very broad. One can think of these materials as uh, alternatives uh, for automotive applications. The rolling hills, Ithaca and, and Cornell sits on a hill. As you look out around the hills, the green and the red and the yellow and the brown and what have you, it's, it's absolutely gorgeous. I think this place is, is very conducive to dreaming in and of itself. If you look around, there's such a sense of history. If you walk across the quad and look at the old 19th century buildings and the statue of Ezra Cornell, sometimes I'll come out at the end of a day and after teaching my last class and step outside and the carillon will start. Damage I did. <laughs> You got those picked up. You squished those too much. I squished them. No, it's just they got interlinked. It's more, this is not squishing too much. This is what happens to your video cables when you... Interlink them. When yeah. you m put them in the car and you don't watch what's doing, they become interlinked. They haven't taken up more space, but they are... See, this is not too good. It's a, it's a little bit of a puzzle. Break and, and Take uh, a little. This is actually good. It's like a puzzle, you know, relaxes the mind. And <laughs> as long as he's not there, there, he's got it. All right. right. <laughs> Unraveling. Right. So, so but, but, but in general, how does something that's not metallic become metallic? So and, the atoms get close to each other. Yep. And the electrons don't only feel the nuclei, that's what keeps them together in atoms. Electrons are negative charge, nuclei are positive charge. The electrons stick to a nucleus in very well-defined quantum mechanical orbits. Mm -hmm. But then when the atoms get closer together, all of a sudden the electrons see the other nuclei of the it's other close atoms. Enough they detect it. Close enough. Until you squeeze them together, they didn't see them. All of a sudden they see them and they say, hey, maybe it's not a bad thing if I move all around the space. Professor, and they begin to the delocalize. Is this a covalent bond there? Is that the no, distance this, for sharpening, sharpening? This happens to be an ionic bond, but it, it, these also turn metallic. Okay. You turn these, and uh, the, these, uh, the electrons on the red atom see begin the to atom see the, the yellow oh, okay. atoms, Wait. and they, they start to move around the whole space. And that's what makes for conducting that's of metal. electricity. That's when the electrons move, right? Yeah. But this happens at what pressure? Does happen at? This happens at varying pressures for varying materials. But, for instance, for diamond, it never happens. Oh, is that right? For so far. Mm -hmm. So far. Uh, for something like um, uh, iodine. Everyone mm -hmm. has seen iodine, beautiful reddish liquid comes in a solution usually you used to put it in the old days on wounds mm -hmm. iodine if you compress it becomes metallic Is that right? the electrons move off the individual iodine atoms and move through the whole solid freely conduct electricity um, people would love to make and i would love to design a material that's a superconductor that's a especially good right. yes at high pressure, maybe bring it back to normal pressure. Should be interesting to you as a researcher? It's a playground. It's a new playground. Hang together, mm -hmm. bond to each other at normal atmospheric conditions. I don't understand it perfectly, but this, but I do understand it. Now here, all of a sudden, are extreme conditions. Extreme, yeah. And really extreme. This is an extreme of pressure. There could be also extremes of heat mm -hmm. uh, and other forms of energy. Mm -hmm. And this gives me a new playground. And by Pushing things to extremes, you often find out about how things behave at the center.
I'm sure because you Because if you, if you can describe the boundaries, you can perhaps also understand the, the center better. I think it's just great fun. I'm uh, sure it is. But let me ask you this question, though. At these extremes, like when, when quantum mechanics was born, that was considered extreme of small. Yes. The classical physics did not anticipate that extreme of things changing That's that right. small. So my question, do you see new fundamental laws of chemistry and physics coming about, or do you just see the extremes which will illuminate the center, as you said? Uh, I don't see any fundamental things coming out, but you know, the infinite variety of molecules that I mm -hmm. can get, both natural and unnatural, describes a kind of microcosm which is so interesting and I haven't exhausted at all. I keep finding new molecules that people haven't yet made. They haven't That's made part of what I do, yeah. is I design new molecules. Uh -huh. Anyway, this extreme I don't think is going to to lead to any new physics, but boy, is it interesting. But would help us understand, I mean, you're talking about these extremes exist at the center of our planet. Yes. They ex exist at a number of other stellar spaces. They're in outer space. So is this going to give us tools, say, to understand astrophysics better? Is there some way in which this is going to contribute in a wider range to man's yes, knowledge of... Yes, I think so. I think we'll know a little bit better about what is the behavior of matter, matter at the inter... In at the interior of Saturn and Jupiter, the uh -huh. large planets. Mm -hmm. Also, perhaps, any new planets that are found. Um, I don't think it's going to make for a better ginger ale, <laughs> but it's going to be, but it's, it gives us new knowledge. But I what love about it. theoretical people like yourself? You're actually very, very theoretical, much more than I am theoretical. Of, I know, it's a wonderful thing, but it, anyway, but does this tell us anything about matter after the Big Bang? Everybody knows the Big Bang, everything is all compressed together. And Look, the pressure yeah. must have been incredible. Yeah. I still, the rules are the same. I don't think it's going to tell us anything new, but I don't want people to be sad about that uh -huh. because I think they have enough trouble understanding their neighbors, if not their girlfriend. Exactly. Uh, so it's not going to, that's enough trouble in this world. We've got world. enough trouble. And got, one I, think, I think it's a lot of fun to understand the world that we have yep. and to stretch it. I just, I said, I, I design new molecules. new molecules. I can think up, despite the fact that there are chemists have made to date something like 75 million new molecules. Is that right? Yeah since this, this particular gang of scientists has been active for 200 years, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I can think up with my computer some molecules that haven't yet been Have made. Have not yet been done. Not yet been made. Wonderful. I call them waiting to be made. <laughs> waiting to be made. Well, we're going to have to uh, leave it there. It's been a great pleasure having you on Thank show. you. Thank you so great. much for your truth. Professor Roll Hoffman, Nobel Laureate in Chemistry at Cornell University. Thank you so much. Bye now. Oh.
He talked about global I mean, warming before it was I'm global warming, so, right? He, yes, he did. He's talking about very he important did. stuff at all. Professor? Yes, sir. Who are your heroes? Like My that? heroes. Oh, I wish I'd asked that. My heroes. Um, Archie Ammons, who was yeah. the poet at Cornell, was one of my heroes. Uh, okay. A wonderful poet. Uh, I think people like uh, Mandela are heroes. They're still human beings, but they're uh, quite remarkable. Uh, the um, I think that some of the people who risk their lives walking before tanks are right Square. now in Libya. Well, or well, what you see in the Middle East Square. now, there are actually a lot of ordinary people that are ordinary heroic. Ordinary heroic figures. Yeah. Boy, the leaders are not heroic. It's a new playground for me. Thank you. 